been taken to claw back the money from Sinn Féin that was spent on the court case that took place solely due to Sinn Féin's refusal to do the right thing and to appoint a minister to oversee the Victim Pensions Fund, Sinn Féin should pay the fees, the legal fees. Thursday. Uh, well, the court was clear that the um, executive, through the actions of not designated department, which was down to just the um, deputy first minister refusing to designate, was acting illegally. Um, he puts forward an interesting proposal that I'm sure that the finance minister, in terms of wanting to make sure that Northern Ireland's finances are well spent, will consider properly. Others to come, Michael. Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 18 and 19 together. At the end of this year, the process of transition to our new relationship with the EU will be completed. I and colleagues across the Cabinet are determined to ensure that Northern Ireland benefits fully from the opportunities that will bring. I'm sure that all in business will welcome the announcement from the Secretary of State that there will be guidance given to all those trading in Northern Ireland by the 1st of November. But can he explain to the House how you formulate guidance for the implementation of a deal that has not yet been done? Or will that guidance be written on the presumption that there will be no deal? Thursday. Um, as, as we have done with the guidance that we outlined just before the, uh, just at the time the House broke the summer recess, we've done that in conjunction with our partners in businesses across Northern Ireland through the um, engagement, business engagement form that we've put together. So we are consulting with businesses about what they need to live on the protocol. And that protocol does give confidence to businesses about what will be in place next year. Alan Cairns. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend recognise that the UK internal market is the cornerstone of simplicity in terms of uh, uncertainty in terms of attracting investment to all parts of the United Kingdom and any detractors from the government's plan and policy to maintain the integrity of the UK internal market would be undermining the uh, potential investments in their community? Secretary. Absolutely right. My honourable friend makes a hugely important point. The UK internal market uh, bill is something that will outline that integral structure of the United Kingdom as one customs union, one single market that gives confidence to businesses and to investors for the benefit of all of our economies. Dr Andrew Morrison. Uh, both I and ministerial colleagues speak regularly with counterparts in the Irish Government. The protocol itself provides for a practical solution that avoids a hard border on the island of Ireland in all circumstances, including in the event that we do not agree a free trade agreement, whilst ensuring that the UK, including Northern Ireland, can leave the EU as a whole. Chandra Morrison. Very grateful to the Secretary of State. Uh, he will know that small and medium-sized enterprises mm. having business across that border are in a state of uncertainty at the moment, given what is potentially going to hit them in four months' time. Uh, given that, uh, the Trade and Support Service that was announced last month is particularly welcome. Um, what discussion has he had uh, with trade organisations in Northern Ireland about the Trade and Support uh, Service, and when does he anticipate the service actually providing services to SMEs? Secretary State. Uh, I thank my honourable friend. He's absolutely right. We have had continued engagement with businesses, as well as um, not just myself, but ministerial colleagues, the business secretary, and uh, the Chancellor, the Duchess of Lancaster, have both been in Northern Ireland engaging with businesses and representative organisations, as is my colleague, um, the Minister of State. And we will continue to do that, and we aim to have this scheme uh, running in September. John Morrissey. Question 21, Mr. Speaker. Thank Minister you. Walker. Mr Speaker, self-isolation exemptions have been in place since the 5th of July for the whole of the United Kingdom for all international cast and crew working on qualifying TV and film productions. We have worked closely with the Northern Ireland Executive and the film and TV industry, which has been a major success in Northern Ireland and represents a significant part of its economy, estimated to be worth £270 million a year. They've, this has seen important projects such as the Northman and Line of Duty restart filming, bringing significant investment to Northern Ireland's economy. John Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree that the quarantine exemption arrangements could be the catalyst for reigniting the Northern Ireland film industry, where 49 um, locations were used for Game of Thrones, including Winterfell? And although um, the days of House Stark have passed, I hope that this exemption will allow for Northern Ireland to continue to be a beacon for the film industry across the world. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. And as, as I said, over the summer we introduced those exemptions and we absolutely recognise what a crucial and important sector this is and the benefits of its success can be seen across Northern Ireland, not least for the tourism industry. Um, and local success stories such as Game of Thrones and the Derry Girls benefit every part of Northern Ireland. Pro programmes like The Fall have firmly established Northern Ireland as an ideal destination for film and TV projects. And the restart of filming 
in significant projects shows that this industry can continue to achieve global success. Step to speaker. Question number 22, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 22 and 23 together. The Government recognises that this industry is key to Northern Ireland's economic success, with the sector in Northern Ireland valued at over £1.8 billion. Like many sectors, aerospace has come under immense pressure during the pandemic. This is why we put unprecedented levels of support into place through the Job Retention Scheme and the Bank of England's COVID corporate finance facility. Last week, I met with Bombardier at their short site and stratospheric platforms to discuss the challenges and opportunities for developing that sector and how the UK government Government can support their success. Stephanie Peacock. Can ministers seem to be doing little more than shrugging their shoulders as the UK's world leading aerospace sector goes to the wall? When will they step in with sector specific support? Minister. Well, I'd say to the uh, Honourable Lady that the UK Government has made available £2.1 billion to the UK aerospace sector through the COVID corporate financing facility and additional flexibility for UK export finance, which is supporting £3.5 billion of sales in the next 18 months. But I continue to work closely with my colleague, the Aerospace Minister, my Honourable Friend for Stratford on Avon, and I'm determined that we do support the businesses in Northern Ireland as across the UK. Gavin Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do trust that the Minister's visit was successful to Bombardier last week. He knows he knows how important aerospace is to the Northern Ireland economy, but he also knows that there is a cliff edge coming uh, in the job retention scheme and the support that is there for our aerospace sector particularly. He also knows that should redundancies continue, should the situation get worse, the skills will be lost and they won't come back. So the time is coming. The talk is talk. We need to see action and we need to see a bespoke package of support for aerospace in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. Minister. Well, I, I absolutely sympathise with the point the Honourable Gentleman is making and the import, crucial importance of this sector and its skills to his constituency. And the, um, the COVID-19 outbreak has seen a severe impact on aviation and aerospace industries around the world. The UK Government has provided significant support to the sector, including the Business Interruption Scheme and the Job Retention Scheme. The Chancellor has confirmed that commitment remains in place until October. But one of the things I discussed um, with Bombardier in my visit last week is the vital importance of maintaining that skills base, uh, and that is a point I will absolutely take to colleagues across government. Cheryl Murray. Question 24, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The threat from dissident Republican terrorism does continue to be severe in Northern Ireland. The government's first priority is to keep people safe and secure across the UK. Terrorism, paramilitary violence, and criminality have no place in Northern Ireland. They must not hold us back from progress towards a peaceful and prosperous future. And as I said earlier on, thanks to the hard work and professionalism of the Police Service of Northern Ireland and their partners, ten people have recently been arrested and charged with a range of terrorism offences under the Terrorism Act. These arrests are the biggest step in tackling violent, dissident Republicans in Northern Ireland in a generation. And I thank the PSNI for their work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What action has the government taken to protect those who provided security in Northern Ireland? both in the police and military, from vexatious historic accusations. Uh, Mark, 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 thank my honourable friend for her question. And we as a government are clear. We will put an end to vexatious claims against our brilliant armed forces. We are also determined to address the legacy of the Troubles, as I set out in my written ministerial statement on the 18th of March, and we will deliver on that. That's the end of Northern Ireland questions, so we're now coming towards Prime Ministers as we await. Can I wish the Leader of the Opposition happy birthday as well? So we now come to question one from Andrew Bowen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Question number one. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Andrew Bowen. Thank you very much. Uh, three weeks ago today, uh, the community in, in my uh, constituency of West Aberdeenshire and Concord, and indeed I think the, the entire country was rocked by the events on the railway line just south of Stonehaven, uh, the tragic events in which three men, uh, Brett McCulloch, Chris Stutchbury and Donald Dinney, tragically lost their lives. I am sure my right honourable friend and the whole House will join me in sending our deepest condolences to the family and friends of those three men today, as well as our thanks and heartfelt gratitude to the incredible men and women of our emergency services and multiple agencies who worked in incredibly difficult uh, conditions to help the survivors from that incident. The interim report is on the desk of the Transport Secretary as we speak, and I know that the full report will take time to run its course, as is only right. But what assurances can my right honourable friend give my constituents that the serious questions that they have will be answered 
any recommendations will be implemented and that the government will do everything it can to prevent an accident like this from ever happening again. Prime Minister. I, I thank my hon. Friend. And I know the Hull House will want to join with me in sending our condolences to the family and friends of Brett McCulloch, uh, Donald Dinney and Christopher Stutbury. And uh, I would like to join my hon. Friend in paying tribute to the extraordinary work of the emergency services and the public for the bravery that they showed. Britain's railways are among the safest in Europe, partly because we take accidents like this so seriously, and therefore we must ensure that we learn the lessons of this tragic event to make sure uh, that no such incident recurs in the future. Now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you. Can I join with the Prime Minister on those comments about the tragic events of just a few weeks ago? Mr Speaker, can I also begin by paying tribute to John Hume, who passed away during recess? John was a beacon of light in the most troubled of times. He'll be seriously missed. Mr Speaker, let me start today with the exams fiasco. On the day that thousands of young people had their A-level grades downgraded, the Prime Minister said, and I quote him, the exam results are robust. They're good. They're dependable. The Education Secretary said there would absolutely not be a U-turn. A few days later, a U-turn. We learned yesterday that the Education Secretary knew well in advance that there was a problem with the algorithm. So a straight answer to a straight question, please, Prime Minister. When did the Prime Minister first know that there was a problem with the algorithm? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, perhaps I could begin by uh, congratulating the Right Honourable Gentleman on his his birthday uh, and uh, say to him that uh, on the exams and Uh, the stress that young people have been through over the summer. Both the Secretary of State for Education and I uh, understand very well how difficult it has been for them and uh, for their families going through a pandemic at a time when we have not been able, because of that pandemic, in common with most other countries in the world, to stage normal examinations. And uh, as a result of what we learned uh, about the uh, the, the tests, that the results that had come in, uh, we did institute a change. We did act. The, the students, the pupils of this country now do have their grades. And I really ask the right honourable gentleman whether he will uh, join me in congratulating uh, those pupils on their hard work and whether he agrees with me that they deserve the grades they've got. Here, Starmer. Mr Speaker, I've already expressed congratulations to all those students, and I do so again. But I want to go back to my question, which the Prime Minister avoided, and I know why he avoided it. Because he either knew of the problem with the algorithm and did nothing, or he didn't know when he should have. So let me ask again, when did the Prime Minister first know there would be a problem with the algorithm? Uh, Mr Speaker, as you know perfectly well, Ofqual made it absolutely clear uh, time and again that in their view uh, the system that was in place was robust. Ofqual is, as he knows, an independent organisation and, uh, and credit had to be given to, to their views. All summer, long, all summer long, Mr Speaker, he's been going around undermining confidence, spreading doubts, and in particular about, about the return to s- school in safe conditions and, and it's absolutely true and today today is a great day because the, the parents the pupils the, uh, of this country the teachers of this country are overwhelmingly proving him wrong and proving the doubters wrong Mr Speaker because they are going back to school in record numbers in spite of all the gloom and dubitation that he tried to spread and I think it would be a fine thing Mr Speaker if today after three months of refusing to do so as pupils go back to school, if today finally he said that school was safe to go back to. Come on. Keir Starmer. The Prime Minister is just tin eared and making it up as he goes along. I'm surprised. The, the, Education Secretary, the Education Secretary stood at that dispatch box yesterday and said and acknowledged that Labour's first priority has been getting children back to school. That's been our first priority. I've said it numerous times in this dispatch box. He knows it very well. He's just playing games. Mr Speaker, and he's fooling nobody. Even his own MPs have run out of patience. The Vice Chair of the 22 Committee, the MP for Broxbourne, has said the government says one thing on Monday, changes its mind on Tuesday, something different is presented on Wednesday. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
another as MPs who wisely wants to remain anonymous, perhaps in the chamber today. He or she said, I am speaking for you because this is what was said, it's mess after mess, his own MPs, U-turn after U-turn. It's a fundamental issue of competence. God knows what's going on. There's no grip. His own MPs are right, aren't they? Oh, Mr. Speaker, this is a, this is a, a, a leader of the opposition who backed uh, remaining in the EU and now is totally silent on the side. Now has performed the U-turn. He backed, he backed, and still, and perhaps he still does, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a, a, a leader of the opposition who supported an IRA condoning uh, politician who wanted to get out of NATO, and now says absolutely nothing. This is a, a, a leader of the opposition who sat on the front bench oh, 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 uh, whilst oh, oh, there was oh, anti-Semitism. Oh, no. I think there are questions being asked. We do need to try and answer the questions that's being put to the Prime Minister. It will be helpful to those who are watching to know the answers. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I think it will be helpful to, to all those who are watching to know. Minister, I think I'll make the decisions today. Come on, Prime Minister. Sorry, Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, if I, if I may say this, I think it will be helpful to all those who are watching to know that this opposition and this leader of the opposition said absolutely nothing. Uh, to oppose the method of examinations that was proposed, uh, and indeed, uh, and, and indeed, they opposed they opposed the teacher the teacher accreditation system that we eventually uh, came came up with. Is he now saying that those grades aren't right, or is it just Captain Hindsight, Captain Hindsight, leaping on a bandwagon and op opposing a policy uh, that he supported uh, two weeks ago? Yes, Starmer. The problem is he's governing in hindsight. That's why he's making so many mistakes. Mr Speaker, before I go on, the Prime Minister said something about the IRA, and I want him to take it back. I worked in Northern Ireland for five years with the police service of Northern Ireland, bringing peace. I prosecuted the Director of Public Prosecution, serious terrorists, for five years, working with the intelligence and security forces and with the police in Northern Ireland. I asked the Prime Minister to have the decency to withdraw that uh, comment. Yeah. 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 Mr Prime Minister, it's the same, it's the same every time. Pretend the problem doesn't exist, brush away scrutiny, make the wrong decision, then blame somebody else. This has got to change, because the next major decision for the Prime Minister is on the furlough scheme. The jobs of millions of people are at risk. The longer he delays, the more they're at risk. So will he act now, finally get this decision right, and commit to extend the furlough for those sectors and those workers that desperately need it? Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, what we are doing in this, in this government is getting people back to school, getting our pupils back to school in spite of uh, all the doubts that he's tried to sow, and we are getting people back to work. What he wants to do is extend uh, the furlough scheme on which this country has already spent £40 billion. What we would rather do is get people into work through our kickstart scheme, which we are launching today, £2 billion, uh, to spend to support people, young people in particular, to get the jobs that they need. He wants to keep people in, out of work in suspended animation. We want to move this country forward. That's the difference between him and us. Can, 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 can I just say there was a question about the allegation and all that. I was very concerned that was the point I was making. I think, in fairness, I'm sure you would like to withdraw. I'm, well, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy uh, to say that I think that uh, I listened to the protestations of the right honourable gentleman. I think they would have been more, they would have been more in order throughout the long, the long years in which he supported, he supported a leader of the Labour Party. When the Prime Minister has worked with the security and intelligence forces uh, I I prosecuting criminals and, and terrorists, he can lecture me. I asked, him, I, asked him to do, I, asked him, I asked him to do the decent thing, but doing the decent thing and this Prime Minister don't go together. This has been a wasted summer. The Government should have spent it preparing for the autumn and winter. Instead, they've lurched from crisis to crisis, U-turn to U-turn. To correct one error, even two might make sense. But when the government's notched up 12 U-turns and rising, the only conclusion is serial incompetence. That serial incompetence is holding Britain back. Will the Prime Minister take responsibility and finally get a grip? Mr. Speaker, I, Mr. Speaker, I take full uh, responsibility for everything that has happened under this government uh, throughout my period in office. And actually, what has happened so far is that we have succeeded in turning the tide of this pandemic. And in spite of, in spite of the, uh, the negativity and the constant sniping from the opposition, 
Uh, we are seeing a country that is not only going back to school, but going back to work. If Britain is in the lead in developing vaccines. We are in the lead in, uh, in, uh, in finding uh, cures for this disease, in dexamethasone. Uh, in finding treatments uh, for this disease. And not only that, Mr Speaker, we are taking this country forward in spite of the extreme difficulties that we face. What I think the, the, the people of, the, of, of this country would appreciate is uh, he and I, the Labour front bench, uh, everybody across this House, coming together and uniting and saying that it is safe for kids to get back to school. And, we, and I must say, Mr Speaker, we still have not heard that. Those words from the right honourable gentleman. Will he now say school is safe? I've said it many, so many times. School is safe. My own children have been in school throughout. There's no issue on this. The Prime Minister is seeking to divide instead of. I, I, wrote to him on the, I, I wrote to him on the 18th of May in confidence and in private, offering my support to him to get kids back to school. The only reason they weren't back before the summer was because of his incompetent education secretary. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will recall that before the recess I asked him if he would meet the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group. I had the privilege of meeting the families on the 15th of July. They gave me incredibly moving accounts of how COVID-19 had taken their loved ones from them. On Sky News last week, the Prime Minister was asked if he would meet the families. And he said, and I'll quote, of course I will meet the bereaved. Of course I will do that. But yesterday, they received a letter from the Prime Minister saying that meeting them was now, regrettably, not possible. The Prime Minister will understand the frustration and the hurt of those families that he said one thing to camera and another to them. Can I urge the Prime Minister to reconsider, to do the right thing and find time to meet these grieving families? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, if I, if I may say to the right honourable gentleman, it's absolutely typical of him that he should frame it in that way, because uh, when I made that answer, of course I was very happy to meet uh, the families of the, uh, of the breed, and I sympathise deeply with all those who have lost loved ones throughout this, this pandemic, and we all uh, feel their pain and, and their grief. But it turns out that this particular group that uh, he refers to are currently in litigation against the government, and I will certainly meet them once that litigation is concluded. Uh, but I may say to him, it would be a better thing, rather than trying to uh, score points in that way, if he joined together with us, and uh, with, with this government, and said not only is school uh, safe, but it is also safe to go back to. And he, and it, by the way, Mr Speaker, that's the first time in four months he said it. As I'm, delighted, I'm delighted to have extracted it from him over this dispatch box. He's never said it to me in the House of Commons. Uh, I hope, Mr. Speaker, I hope, Mr. Speaker, he will also say, he will also say that it is safe for the workforce of this country to go back to work in a COVID-secure way. We want to take this country forward. We're not only getting the pandemic under control, with deaths down, with hospital admissions way, way down. We will continue to tackle it with local lockdowns, with our superlative test and trace system, which, by the way, which, by the way, before they, before they sneer, before they mock at it, Mr Speaker, has now conducted more tests than any other country in Europe. And, and he might hail that rather than sneering at this country's achievements. Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, discussions in the joint committee established under the withdrawal agreement will have the most crucial bearing on the future of trade, not only between the UK and the EU, but also within the UK itself. Uh, unless otherwise agreed in that committee, goods passing from Great Britain to Northern Ireland will be subject to the full rigour of the European Customs Code and also to the imposition of tariffs. That would be quite unacceptable, so will my right honourable friend commit to do whatever it takes to ensure that it does not happen? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, I, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the uh, concern that he does, and uh, we must, of course, and will deliver on uh, what the protocol says, which is that there shall be unfettered access uh, between GB, NI and NI, uh, GB, and uh, there should be no tariffs, and uh, we, will, uh, we will legislate uh, in the course of the next uh, months to guarantee that. We now come to the Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford, on the first of two questions. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on the tragedy that we witnessed uh, close to Stonehaven, and indeed to the 
tribute that we had to John Hume from the leader of the opposition. John Hume, a man that did so much for the delivery of peace in the island of Ireland. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister told his cabinet, and I quote, I am no great nautical expert, but sometimes it is necessary to tack here in response to the facts that, that, as they change. It was surprisingly honest for the Prime Minister to admit his government is all at sea. A UK government now defined by eight U-turns in eight months. But if the Prime Minister is true to his word, then surely he must see sense and change tack for a ninth time. With the clock ticking for struggling businesses and workers, will the Prime Minister commit today to extend the job retention scheme beyond October? Or is his government making the political choice to accept levels of unemployment last seen under Thatcher in the early 1980s? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I had uh, members of uh, opposite on, on, on all parties that seem to want to extend the, the furlough scheme, uh, which has uh, already uh, cost this country £40 billion, pounds, kept, uh, took, uh, helped supported 11 million people, but after all, keeps them in suspended animation and prevents them from going to work. What we want to do is get people back to work. And that's, why, and that's why I hope he will instead support our Kickstarter scheme to get young people into jobs and support them in those jobs. How much better is that than languishing out of work? In Blackford. My goodness, Mr Speaker, languishing out of work. The furlough scheme is there to protect people so they can come back to work when the time is right. Mr Speaker, France, Germany and Ireland have extended their furlough scheme into 2021. Mr Speaker, they have made a moral choice. They are not prepared to punish their people with record levels of unemployment. You know, Mr Speaker, people in Scotland are seeing a tale of two governments. While the Tories are cutting follow scheme support, yesterday Nicola Sturgeon was announcing new investment to protect jobs, including a youth guarantee. We all know that jobs are under threat if the furlough scheme ends in October. The power to end this threat lies with the Prime Minister. Will he do his duty and extend the furlough scheme, or are we going to return to levels of unemployment last seen under Thatcher with the resultant human misery? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, what we are doing is not only uh, continuing with the furlough scheme, as he knows, until the end of this month, which is by far, by far more generous, by the way, than anything provided in France or, or Germany yes. or Ireland. We're continuing with it. With it. Uh, but we will also, uh, after, after that scheme elapses, we will get on uh, with other measures to support people in work. And starting today, there is the Kickstarter scheme to help young people get the jobs that they need. Uh, that is in addition to a £160 billion package that we have spent to support the economy throughout this crisis. This government has put its arms around all the people of this country to support them throughout the crisis. That is what we are doing, and we will now help them to get back into work. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I share my Vice Honourable Friend's enthusiasm that those who can get back to work safely in their offices should do so. But realistically, many will only want to do so for two or three days a week. Can I urge him to use his considerable powers of persuasion to encourage the rail industry to introduce immediately flexible season tickets uh, so that those people are not tied into traditional work patterns, both to help many thousands of commuters in uh, areas like mine in Ashford, but also to help save the rail industry? Well, I, I, I thank the, the right honourable, my right honourable friend, and uh, he's absolutely right that uh, we are working at pace with rail companies uh, to try to deliver n new uh, products in terms of, uh, of ticketing, which ensure uh, not just better value, uh, but also enable people uh, to get back to work in a flexible way. Sir so Geoffrey Donaldson. Can I thank the Prime Minister and the Chancellor for the financial and economic interventions their government have made to date? But he will be aware, as much as we want to see people back in work, that there are certain sectors, uh, such as tourism, travel, hospitality and aerospace, where that will not be possible in the short to medium term. Therefore, can I encourage the Prime Minister to look at a targeted, targeted extension for those sectors? 
and also to look at a specific UK-wide scheme to help those so far who, who have been excluded uh, from uh, the current schemes, including the newly self-employed. Prime yeah. Minister. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, the, the, as, as, as the right honourable gentleman knows, there are a, a great number of, of schemes in addition to the, the job retention scheme uh, that support people uh, in work and in all uh, sorts of sectors of the coronavirus loans, the bounce back loans, the, the grants that we've made to businesses of all kinds. Uh, he mentions the tourism and hospitality sector. We've uh, made huge investments in those. There's a very successful uh, eat out to help out uh, scheme that we've been, uh, we've been running. Uh, but it is also very important that we get people uh, back into the workplace in a COVID secure way. And uh, unlike uh, the leader of opposition, we do absolutely everything we can to give them confidence that it is a, a good idea uh, to, to go back. And an ounce of confidence, Mr Speaker, is worth a tonne of taxpayers' money. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Bounce Back Loan Scheme has been a huge success, delivered by the Prime Minister and, indeed, the Chancellor. 1.3 million loans being granted vital support for, for SMEs. But the All-Party Group on Fair Business Banking, which I co-chair, has established that there are 250,000 businesses who currently bank with fintechs and alternative lenders who do not have access to those loans because they cannot get access to the Bank of England's term funding scheme and lenders who do have those loans are not really accepting uh, loan applications from new customers. Would the Prime Minister use his best offices to persuade the Governor of the Bank of England to open up the term funding scheme to those uh, alternative finance uh, uh, organisations or open the doors of other lenders who can provide those schemes, those loans, to other SMEs? Prime Minister. Well, uh, I, I thank my, uh, my honourable friend. He raises an important point. Those, uh, as he will know, uh, the rules around access to uh, schemes for alternative uh, finance uh, uh, are not uh, the responsibility of my uh, right honourable friend, the Chancellor, but uh, for, for the Bank of, uh, of England. But I'm sure the Governor will have heard him uh, today. The note come to Owen Thompson. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And over the summer months, many people undertake a range of activities. For some, it's uh, camping. Uh, for others, it's festivals and events. In my Midlothian constituency, we've got a number of highly successful employers in audiovisual technology, hospitality and creative industries, none of whom can currently undertake their normal activities. In the face of this, when furlough ends, these companies could face collapse. What should I tell them? That the government are today going to extend the scheme to make sure the industry can get back on its feet, or has the government completely given up on them? Here, here. Prime Minister. Uh, not at all, Mr Speaker. This is, we've, we've supported the, uh, the arts uh, uh, industry alone with, I think, about £1.7 billion pounds of, uh, of support. And uh, in Scotland, as I'm sure he never, he never tires of, of saying, uh, the, overall, uh, the overall support for uh, tackling coronavirus has been of the order of about four. Uh, billion pounds, uh, and we will continue uh, to give support. But we, we happen to think, and I hope it's common ground across the House, we happen to think that it would be better for the UK economy, better for all the people that he rightly cares about, uh, to get back into work, Mr Speaker. James Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, one positive among the gloom of the COVID pandemic is that this year's I'm a Celebrity will be filmed not in New South Wales, Australia, but in our own North Wales. Even if I cannot tempt the Prime Minister to take part in a Welsh Tucker trial, would he can commend ITV on its choice of venue and welcome the positive impact this can have on the regional economy? Prime Minister. I, I, I thank my honourable friend, and he's, he's right to, to draw attention to uh, the, the, the wonderful attractions of, uh, of North Wales, uh, which I know uh, very well myself. Uh, when I tried to get elected there many years ago, uh, uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, but, uh, and I congratulate him on his success and may it be long repeated. Heading up to Adrian Shots with Neil Gray. Neil Gray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Earlier this summer, the Treasury floated a story in The Telegraph suggesting a public sector pay freeze to save money. Given so many public sector workers, such as nurses, police, firefighters, teachers and others have put their lives on the line to fight COVID, Surely this would be an unconscionable betrayal. Will the Prime Minister therefore unequivocally not only rule out a pay freeze, but commit to fully funding a package to ensure they are remunerated to reflect their sacrifices? 
So I, 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 I must say, I, I, I listened carefully to what the Honourable Gentleman said. He seems to, he seems to ignore the fact, Mr Speaker, that we've just had an inflation-busting public sector pay rise and that, uh, and that n n nurses alone, and as part of the package uh, that we agreed in 2018, have had a 12.5% uh, pay increase uh, since then. Uh, I, I appreciate his sentiments. He's on the right lines, but he should look at what's actually happening. Yeah. Angela Richardson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Alexander Dennis has been manufacturing buses in Guildford for over 100 years with exciting new low and zero emission vehicles. I'm sure my right honourable friend will be as saddened as I was to hear that 200 jobs have been made redundant locally. Does he agree with me that the fantastic skills these workers have are vital for, as part of our green recovery? And will he work with me and colleagues to ensure the long-term success of UK bus manufacturing for both domestic and export markets? Prime Minister. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for her very apposite uh, intervention on behalf of Alexander Dennis. I'm a, a, a keen customer, uh, was a keen customer of Alexander uh, Dennis's fantastic machines, and I hope that our green recovery and our massive investment in, uh, in green buses, and I can't guarantee this, but I hope it will be of benefit uh, to uh, the workforce of Alexander Dennis. Heading to Swansea West with Garant Davis. Garant Davis. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is stumbling forward into mass unemployment with the sudden and universal removal of furlough and towards a further spike and resurgence in coronavirus due to making people who are working from home travel to work. In order to minimise uh, further and future bad decisions and U-turns, will he fully restore the online parliament uh, so that all voters can be fully represented in all debates and all lawmaking, as happens in the Welsh Government and the Scottish Government and the Lords, whether their MPs are uh, shielded or unshielded, so that we make the best decisions with the least harm during the pandemic and during the recession by the reintroduction of proper online democracy. Prime Minister. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. I encourage him to return from from New York or Shanghai, or where he, uh, where, where he is, and uh, and, to, and to join us as as fast as uh, as, as we can uh, here in this house. And I think actually what the people of, the, of this country want to see is uh, their representatives, uh, their representatives uh, back on their seats as fast as possible in the Palace of Westminster, uh, and that is what we should work for. That's why we're working together to drive down this virus and create a COVID secure environment. Andrew Lawyer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, when I buy a copy of the Mirror, the Mail, or the Telegraph, I'm not required to buy a copy of the Guardian. And yet, when I want to watch live TV on Sky, Amazon Prime, or ITV, I am forced to pay for the BBC. Does the Prime Minister believe that this is a sustainable situation in the medium or longer term? Uh, well, uh, my, my honourable friend makes a, a very interesting uh, point, a point of view I'm sure shared by many people in this country, but uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Culture, uh, Media and Sport, will be setting out a roadmap shortly for reform uh, of the BBC uh, and addressing the very issue that he mentions. Just going down to Brentford and Nisleworth with Ruth Cabré. Ruth Cabré. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Financial Times published a list of the 12 government U-turns made under this Prime Minister, from the exam results fiasco to the contact tracing app uh, to the wearing of masks. He's just said that he takes full responsibility. So I wonder which of those 12 U-turns is the Prime Minister's favourite? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know it, uh, it's, a, it's a rare privilege to have, ask a question in the House of Commons. You would have thought they could come up with something better than that. Uh, I, 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 I really, I have to. All I want to say to her is that this is a, this is a, this is a global pandemic that this government is dealing with extremely effectively at a medical level. And what we want to do now is, in a COVID-secure way, not only get our children uh, back into school, because that's what's happening today, in spite of the, uh, I don't know where she's been on this, on this question, but in spite of the, uh, the leader of the opposition and his colleagues. And what we also want to do is get our country economy back on its feet again and get us back to work. So I hope that she and her colleagues uh, will say that it is also safe to go back to work in a COVID secure way. I, thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will be well aware that welcome though it is, the start of the new term this week will be challenging for all schools. It will be particularly so for Burton Green Church of England Academy in my constituency where HS2 has just closed 
the road that many parents use to access the school. It's done that for several months with little notice or consultation and contrary to assurances given during the passage of the HS2 bill. This is not, as my right honourable friend well knows, the first or only example of high-handedness or poor communication on the part of HS2. So will he please help me to require of HS2 that it does better for the people of Burton Green and elsewhere on the route? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, well, yes, Mr Speaker. Well, I, I, I heartily uh, endorse, I'm afraid, the sentiments that he's expressed. Anybody who's, uh, who's worked with HS2 over the last uh, few years uh, will know that they, uh, they uh, do treat uh, local residents uh, with, with, I'm afraid, a high-handed uh, approach, or have done. And uh, what I can tell him, however, is that where there is damage to local roads, HS2 will pay compensation. I will certainly take his point up with, uh, with HS2. Tosborne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Low public confidence and social distancing measures means many businesses are struggling. If the job retention scheme ends in October, there will be catastrophic consequences for workers, businesses and the economy. So despite earlier waffle from the Prime Minister, I'm asking him again, will he commit to extending the job retention scheme or are we to expect more government incompetence resulting in unnecessary redundancies and further strains on our already collapsing economy? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I direct the Honourable Lady to what I've said already, which is that uh, there will always be those uh, who argue for an infinite, infinite extension of the furlough scheme and who want to keep people uh, off work, unemployed, uh, being paid very substantial sums uh, for, a, for, for a, lo a very long time. I don't think that's the right thing. I think the best way for our, forward for our country is to get people as far as we possibly can back into work. And there, are, there is the job retention bonus, as she knows, at the end of the year, and there are abundant schemes. Already £160 billion has been spent uh, to support the economy throughout the crisis, and we will continue, as I said, to put our arms around the entire people to keep them going throughout this crisis. But furlough, indefinite furlough, is just not the answer. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our nation has a proud history as a safe haven for desperate souls, but now the asylum system is broken and being abused. So the people of Ashfield would like to know when will the Prime Minister introduce legislation to fix the asylum system, which will save lives by taking back control of our borders? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend, and I have a great deal of sympathy with those who are so desperate as to uh, put their children in dinghies or even children's paddling pools and try to, try to cross the, the channel. But I have to say that what they are doing is, uh, is falling prey to, to criminal gangs and they are breaking the law. They are also undermining the, the legitimate claims of others who would seek asylum in this country. And that is why we will uh, take advantage of leaving the EU uh, by changing the Dublin uh, regulations on returns. And we will address the rigidities in our laws that make this country, I'm afraid, a target and uh, a magnet uh, for those who would exploit vulnerable people in this way. Gavin Robinson. Yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker, and I trust that the Prime Minister had an enjoyable visit to Harland Woods New Yard in Appledore. Um, he knows well the mother yard of Harland Wolf in my constituency of East Belfast, uh, and I just ask that the Prime Minister not only recognises the important strategic purchase of Appledore, but recognise that Harland Wolf are now in an incredibly well placed position to assist this country in our future defence needs. Prime Minister. Oh. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. And yes, it was incredibly exciting to go to Appledore and see the potential of that, of that yard and to see what Harland and Wolf uh, is is doing there and also of course he's absolutely right in what he says about the potential for various other contracts uh, both in uh, both in Devon and and in Belfast but I uh, can't give him uh, now the kind of guarantees that he wants over this dispatch box but watch this space. Mr Blackford you have given me notice of this point of order I think it is important just to clear up this matter it isn't normally that I would allow urgent questions to be interfered with those statements. So therefore, on this case, I'm going to allow it. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm most grateful. On Friday the 21st of August, the Daily Mail ran a front page story revealing the location of the Prime Minister's holiday in Scotland. This was a violation of his family's privacy that neither myself nor my party in any way condone. Later the same day, 
A senior Conservative source in Downing Street told the Sun newspaper, and I quote, The finger of blame for all this getting out is being pointed at the SNP, particularly Ian Blackford, who is local. This was subsequently repeated in a number of newspapers and broadcast outlets. This allegation and briefing was entirely and deliberately false. It was a targeted political smear from the Prime Minister's office. The photographer who provided the material for the original Daily Mail front page later confirmed that I was not the source in revealing the Prime Minister's location. A location, I might add, I was not even aware of. However, by this point, the damage was done. This matter has not only been the worst kind of political smear, the false allegation has equally resulted in security implications for myself and my family, given its serious and personal nature. You know, I can see the Prime Minister pulling a face, but all you have to do is to go to social media and see the threats that I was then forced to witness. It is a very serious situation when the apparatus of the UK government can be deployed in this way, manufacturing false briefings in order to attack an opposition politician. I raised this issue with the Prime Minister's office in writing. However, as I have not received a response, I am raising this point of order today to ensure these false briefings are now stopped and are never repeated for any parliamentarian. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, may I first of all say what a wonderful uh, staycation holiday I had in the uh, right honourable gentleman's constituency. What a fantastic part of the world it is and how thoroughly I commend uh, it to, to everybody. It's absolutely beautiful uh, location. He's very, he's very lucky to, to represent it. On the substantive point that he, that he raises, I'm very happy to accept uh, uh, the assurances that he, he gives. However, I just draw his attention to, to, he talks about going to social media. I draw his attention to uh, a, a tweet by a chap called Torquil Crichton uh, on 17th of August saying, ferocious midge count in Wester Ross tonight, I hear, must be bad if you're fair-skinned and camping. And uh, to which uh, an account that purports to be the honourable, right honourable gentleman, but I'm sure it isn't because, I, because of what he has just said, uh, says, I wonder if an education in Eton stands you in good stead uh, for these blighters. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that I'm sure that he had absolute. I'm happy to accept uh, his assurances and his protestations, and I think we should leave it at that, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what I would like to say, obviously. What, Mr. Brennan, thank you. Can I, can I just say what I am very concerned about is the security implication to the Prime Minister and the security implication to the leader of the SNP. Please, can I just say to everyone, let's be very, very careful and let's learn from this. And obviously, it is on the record from both parties, and I hope we can draw a line under it. But please, let's take each other's security very, very serious. Thank you. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating the next, I am now suspending the House for three minutes. Order. Thank you.
We now come to the urgent question. I call Nick Thomas Simmons to ask his urgent question. Yeah, Nick Thomas yeah, Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ask the Home Secretary to make a statement on those crossing the English Channel in small boats. Secretary. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In recent months, the UK has seen a completely unacceptable increase in illegal migration through small boat crossings from France to the UK. This Government and the Home Secretary are working relentlessly to stop these crossings. Illegal migration is not a new phenomenon. Every Government over the last 20 years and more has experienced migrants, often economic migrants, attempting to reach the UK through illegal means. The majority of these crossings are facilitated by ruthless criminal gangs who make money from exploiting migrants who are desperate to come here. We are working with the National Crime Agency to go after those who profit from such misery. Already this year, 24 people have been convicted and jailed for facilitating illegal immigration. In July, I joined a dawn raid on